So now we are going to switch gears towards a different type of industry. Uh, Deepak Bansal from Microsoft Azure is going to explain us how cloud providers are seeing how the network transform their business. Thank you, Deepak. Hi, I'm Deepak. I run the uh, Azure virtual network and load balancing teams. And today I'm going to talk about uh, how we're adapting SDN to make it more uh, usable and more uh, easy to manage for microservices. Okay, maybe I'm supposed to use that clicker. Can I get to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So as previous speakers have talked about, applications are moving to microservices. What that means is rather than application being built as a single monolithic uh, software, it's composed of many modular components. And these application instances rather than re residing on a single infrastructure, they're distributed across multiple infrastructure. They may be running in the cloud, across multiple cloud vendors, and they may be running in, on the data, in the data centers. The way applications are upgraded, rather than a reconfiguration of the entire application, you can update each individual, individual microservice without bringing your entire application down. And then the network services, rather than them being implemented specifically for a particular application, these network services are now implemented as a platform running as a fabric available for all microservices to use. Okay, so the challenges that we hear our customers are facing when they're moving to microservices or building new applications uh, using the microservice architecture. One of the main one we hear is integration with existing infrastructure. Customers have existing deployments, maybe their identity infrastructure, maybe their storage, maybe they have a SAP HANA deployment that their application needs to access. So all the existing infrastructure that they have they need their microservices to be able to access that existing infrastructure. Right? The next challenge that we hear from our customers is regarding management. Microservices are like swarm of worker bees. Right? If they are well managed, then they can be very powerful. But if they are not well managed, then it leads to challenges in the security space. How do you know which microservice is exposing what endpoints and whether it's exposed to a hacker or not? Monitoring and diagnostics becomes very hard with microservices because now we have so many microservices running in my environment. Uh, when an issue happens, how do I identify which particular microservice is encountering an issue? Uh, auto scaling also becomes a challenge with microservices and discovery, right? So these are the management challenges that our customers face as they implement microservice based architectures for their applications. Next scale. Uh, traditionally, applications have, or customers have had to manage thousands of VMs for their application. But now that has translated into hundreds of thousands of microservices that may be involved in any service. So managing those hundreds and uh, hundreds of thousands of microservices becomes a challenge. One of the challenge that our customers talk about is running out of IP addresses. When they have so many microservices, how do they manage the IP address space for, for those microservices? Policy specification is another challenge that customers face because with so many microservices, how do you specify policies around isolation, around uh, security? Uh, those require uh, rethinking. And then there is a diverse ecosystem for microservices. We have Kubernetes, we have OpenShift, so customers are uh, continuously challenged with, hey, which ecosystem should they, they pick or go with? So let, let me start with the first problem that, that our customers talk about, which is integration with existing infrastructure, right? So here, uh, one of the things that we have been working towards is what we call federated network control, right? So customers may have different network control planes for managing their different uh, application components, right? On one hand, they may have a container level network control for managing their container based deployments. They may have a VM network controller for managing their VM deployments. And they may have some other network control which is running on premise uh, for managing their servers and VMs on premise. And these network controls need not, network controllers need not be from the same vendor. They can be from different vendors, they can be from same vendor. By federating between these network controllers, you get 
a consistent view of the network and a seamless connectivity across all these various uh, application infrastructures that you may be using. An example of this federated network control is uh, Azure Delegated Network Controller, which we have implemented in Azure to enable seamless connectivity between uh, containers running on Azure platform and VMs running on Azure platform. So customers can have part of their workload deployed as a microservice and part of their workload running in VMs, and these workloads can all talk to each other, and they can talk to on-premise. And the way it works is uh, there is a delegated network controller that gets its uh, responsibility from the network controller. So the customer requests the network controller to delegate certain portion of their network to the delegated network controller. And from then on, that delegated network controller is, is responsible for managing that portion of the network. But keep in mind, because of, of this federation between the delegated network controller and the Uber network controller, these two networks appear as one, and applications can communicate seamlessly across, uh, across containers and virtual machines. There is an explicit authorization that customer provides to the delegated network controller, which enables the delegated network controller to manage that network space. On the VMs itself, there's a network plugin that is running, and that network plugin is responsible for managing the network for the containers and uh, communicating with the host stack, which is where the SDN is implemented or the network virtualization is implemented. So the same uh, host virtualization stack is being leveraged here by the containers as well as by the virtual machines, and hence they're able to communicate seamlessly with each other. To support fast provisioning of the network for the containers, we provide what we call bottoms up API, whereby the network plugin from inside the virtual machine can make API calls to the host and configure network on demand for those containers. And by leveraging this, this bottoms-up provisioning, the, the whole delegated network controller and the containers are getting connectivity uh, seamlessly to each other from this bottoms-up provision. Okay, moving on to the management si aspect, right? So layer three, layer four SDN has done a good job at providing connectivity, right? Uh, SDN is, is well established in all the cloud providers and customers can deploy their virtual machines in virtual networks, VPCs, and so forth. Service in insertion routing primitives have also been well established in the layer three, layer four SDN space. Customers can insert network virtual appliances by leveraging various mechanisms that layer three, layer four SDN provides and thereby control how the traffic gets routed uh, within their virtual network. Uh, Additionally, layer three, layer four SDN has provided load balancing, on-premise connectivity, and various other capabilities that applications need to, uh, to function from, from the virtual network in the cloud environment. However, layer three, layer four SDN has lacked in few, few areas, which is where service mesh comes in, right? So security is one such area. Managing the certificates for communication among all the, the microservices is one area where layer three, layer four SDN hasn't done a good job at. Monitoring and diagnostics. It is very hard to diagnose issues at layer three, layer four layers, as previous speakers have also alluded to. So, uh, so that's another area where layer three, layer four SDN hasn't done a good job. Scalability, ease of deployment and testing, these are other areas which are very attractive to customers uh, as far as service mesh are concerned because they do not get those as well from layer three, layer four SDN solutions that exist in, uh, that are currently provided by the cloud providers. So the answer to this is what I say a combination, a coexistence of layer three, layer four SDN and layer seven SDN, which is what I call service mesh, right? It's not that, hey, we want to reinvent everything that we've done in layer three, layer four SDN now at layer seven and completely replace layer three, layer four SDN with layer seven SDN. And similarly, there are things that layer three, layer four SDN cannot do that are much better done at layer seven SDN. So what we need is a coexistence solution where customers are able to leverage both uh, SDN at both layers and uh, get the benefit that they need. 
So uh, along those lines, uh, the layer three, layer four SDN still provides the basic connectivity within and across microservices, right? So there is an IP level connectivity that is available within the microservices and then connecting the microservices to, to each other. Uh, layer seven SDN can build on top of that and provide higher layer, layer abstraction to control cross microservice interaction, right? So it can, can provide additional value on top of what the basic uh, connectivity and isolation primitives are being provided by, by the layer three, layer four SGN. Similarly, when there is need for high performance, uh, high bandwidth and low latency communication, application may choose to leverage layer three, layer four SDN, whereas when, uh, when someone is talking about uh, communication across microservices, that's where layer seven SDN becomes most useful. Uh, layer three, layer four SDN is implemented in, in the host by the cloud providers on the virtual switches running in the host, uh, whereas layer seven SDN requires service proxies and, and that does introduce uh, both the CPU as well as performance overhead. Uh, layer three, layer four SDN provides service insertion, uh, whereas uh, layer seven SDN allows for uh, better certificate management and better logging. So essentially, uh, the, the position that, that we are proposing to customers and that we see customers adopting is a combination of, of both. And what we need to work on as an industry is how do we make both of these seamless to the customers? We, we do not want a scenario where customers have to manage layer seven policies in one way and layer three, layer four policies in a completely different and isolated way. Uh, worse, it would be horrible if, if it resulted in two different islands, right? Layer three, layer four SDN VMs and, and containers are one island and layer seven managed containers are another island, right? We want seamless connectivity. And similarly, the security policies and micro segmentation, customers should not get two different views of, of the world. Hey, there is a network team which has one view of the world on who can talk to who, and there is an application team which has another view of the world on who can talk to who, right? Ultimately, the micro segmentation policies have to be consistent across both stacks and have to be exposed to the customers in a unified way rather than completely disconnected ways. So before I end, I wanted to give a brief uh, comparative analysis of, of the various uh, 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 SDN solutions that are out there that are available to customers. And, and we see customers constantly struggling between these various solutions, right? Which solution to use uh, and, and uh, uh, how to decide what technology is the best. Uh, I picked four here. Uh, there are many more out there and, and we see customers using a wide variety of SDN solutions. Uh, they are more or less similar at this stage, uh, but there are some, some differences that I call out here. Um, so as far as network model is concerned, Calico has implemented it at layer three level where, whereby via BGP they are able to control how the traffic gets routed and, and provide connectivity between between the network endpoints. Uh, the other three all leverage overlays. Uh, VXLAN or NVGRE overlay uh, is, is the network model that, that they provide. Network policies. This is an, an area that is actually very uh, critical for microservices. As I alluded to earlier, uh, customers find it really hard to manage network policies in a microservice environment. Uh, Calico has done a lot of work uh, in implementing Kubernetes network policies uh, and integrating with it. Uh, Flannel and Weave uh, still provide subnet-based uh, uh, isolation, which is hard to manage in the microservice world because, again, the subnets, uh, microservices grow and shrink fast, and it's hard to manage isolation at a subnet layer. Azure CNI provides both Kubernetes network policies as well as tags which enable uh, uh, customers to be able to tag their workloads and provide uh, micro segmentation or provide policies based on those tags. Uh, then there are a number of uh, other capabilities like load balancing, name, naming service, on-premise connectivity. Uh, these capabilities uh, as part of, of the cloud platform, uh, we make it available for, uh, uh, for VMs and containers uh, in the cloud. Some of the other solutions you have to 
deploy uh, third party load balancing appliances, third party VPN appliances, or some open source solution to, to get those, those uh, connectivity. Finally, on the layer seven uh, SDN integration, uh, the Calico has done some work to integrate with Istio's network policies. Uh, the other solutions are, have still not made progress in that space, but that's an important area to give that unified view of SDN to customers and not, not two different views of SDN to customers. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, microservices are putting new demands on SDN, and uh, to meet those demands, we need a unified approach to SDN uh, that includes federation of network control uh, across multiple uh, network SDN control planes that customer may deploy, and we need a service mesh solution that is integrated with layer three, layer four SDN for easier management uh, to enable uh, customers to, to leverage SDN and, and uh, be able to use SDN for microservices. Traditional networking, whether it's uh, SDN or non-SDN, typically you have uh, a whole infrastructure to do network performance monitoring, application performance monitoring, security monitoring, of whether it's application or the network. Um, in the service mesh world, what do you see? Uh, are those capabilities required, and how do you see, if so, um, where do they come into picture? Yeah, so I think traditional networking has done a horrible job at monitoring diagnostics. Uh, when, when an application breaks, uh, if it comes down to networking, it takes a horribly long period of time to isolate which part of the network is dropping packets or if, if network is even the culprit or not, right? Uh, and that's what is motivating customers to look at these technologies like service mesh so they can get better visibility into what traffic is flowing over the network and and whether there is a performance issue or or a reliability issue with the network so so i certainly see uh, service mesh playing a critical role in helping us improve the reliability and monitoring for the network uh, uh, compared to traditional networking solutions it does not it is not uh, like you could still continue using your traditional network monitoring solutions, right? Your SNMP and whatnot on, on your physical devices. It does not preclude usage of those, but as we have seen uh, numerous times over the years, those mechanisms are grossly inefficient uh, and service mesh will help uh, uh, improve that and, and, and make network more manageable and, and be better monitored. Just out of curiosity, because you had mentioned in here, you know, layer three, layer four versus layer seven, and trying to unify the policy portion. What are you guys working on currently in terms of thought process about how that's going to work? What abstraction? I mean, I, I know you can use Azure Resource Manager to be able to do this, but what what other extensible ways are you thinking about actually laying that out there? And is it going to be anything you open source and community contribute? Okay, great question. So, uh, regarding what our current thinking is, uh, I think we are still in very early stages. What you are seeing here is, is a need that we have felt uh, as more and more customers have been talking about uh, service mesh. Uh, we haven't done much uh, progress on it yet. Uh, like you said, ARM would be one place where we could uh, unify both policy specification. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is really uh, the call to the industry here because uh, uh, again, uh, we are doing all this in open source, and whatever we do here, we will be putting it out in, in open source. But as an industry, we need to, to realize that, that, hey, if the service mesh folks keep working in isolation and the traditional SDN guys keep working in isolation, then it will be uh, bad for both solutions for our customers because customers will have to pick between one or the other whereas they cannot, they, they are forced to use both. So, so it is up to us as an industry to, to proactively work on unifying these two policy models so that they, they don't become two divergent uh, experiences for our customers.
Yes. Okay, it's working now. Um, I hear you mention whoa, earlier in the presentation that you're extending that solution on with your on-prem stack, right? Which means that the control plane, either through a delegated controller or not, needs to get extended on-prem. That control plane is linked to the global control plane that you have at Microsoft at this point in Azure. So what do you do to, if something gets corrupted, somebody hacks it, because basically they have access to your control plane and could potentially affect your entire service. So what measures do you have in place right now to, or is it a different stack, or how do you segment, or how do you control that blast radius that could potentially be extended all the way to the client? Um, yeah, again, great question. And something that we haven't done a lot of work in to, to control the blast radius, what we've done so far is, is not uh, federation between on-premise and the cloud. What we've done so far is federation between container SDN and the VM SDN in the cloud. But like you said, uh, the same concept extends to on-premise. Uh, the, the nice thing about delegation is there is good separation of duties, right? Once a space is delegated, one controller controls that delegated space, the other controller controls the other space, uh, uh, and and that's that's how the partition partitioning works there. Uh, without delegation, it becomes challenging because you can have conflicting policies applied in the two controllers, and and federating complex uh, conflicting policies will be become much harder. Um, I think in terms of the the blast radius, uh, it's it's an interesting uh, challenge uh, that SDN faces overall because. Uh, Whereas earlier it used to take days to open a ticket with, with the network engineer and for the network engineer to apply a change, even then they could have a big blast radius. But with cloud, with SDN, everything via click of a button, the blast radius becomes really challenging because customers can screw themselves up via a single click, put in an NSG or, or an Apple that blocks all connectivity kind of scenarios that are, are very possible. One of the solutions that uh, that we are thinking about and exploring there uh, is to give capabilities to customers so that they can flight the change before it is actually applied, and that flighting can be done either on uh, through static analysis, through uh, simulations by directing some portion of the traffic through that flighted configuration uh, to help customers validate a configuration change before it gets applied. So those are some of the techniques that we are looking at to reduce the blast radius. Uh, this, uh, the federation in itself does not make the blast radius bad or or, or better. Uh, federation helps provide, especially the way we have implemented via delegation, uh, isolation of, of control over which part of the network is controlled by what network controller. He pretty much asked my question. Um, I'm SDN underscore girl, so you're talking my language here. And um, that was my concern. It's a multi-cloud world, and I see different traditional network vendors are trying to build that hybrid and multi-cloud strategy, and then the public cloud providers are trying to provide that kind of going the opposite direction. And right now we're in a place where a lot of stuff isn't really working together. So what is your multi-cloud strategy? Um, so, uh, as far as uh, our multi-cloud strategy is concerned, uh, for on-premise and, and Microsoft's Azure public cloud, we of course have Azure Stack, which mirrors the capabilities that customers get on the public cloud. So between on-premise and, and the public cloud, Microsoft's public cloud, uh, we have seamless experience. Uh, as far as third, other cloud vendors are concerned, uh, I, the work that we are doing with Azure CNI is in open source, and that's something that we are looking into making it work on other public clouds as well. We haven't uh, yet made a decision there, uh, but our intention is to do all this work in open source in a way that it can work seamlessly across, the pub, across multiple public clouds and across on-premise, uh, uh, both Windows and Linux. Is this on? Is this on? Um, 
I've got a question around service mesh. One of the things that we've been looking at in the last five years is NFV, network functions, virtualization. And it seems to me that uh, NFV is now definitely out of fashion and that service message is a, is a reforging of NFE into a workable format, so it's all the rage. It's this, this season's little black dress. Um, will it actually stick? Like, everybody in cloud seems to follow the latest fashion. This week it's Adidas sneakers, next week it's Nike sneakers, this week it's red t-shirts, next week it's this and that, right? So I'm a little weary of the rate of change in the cloud. You want to make a posit as to whether the service mesh will actually stick or whether it's going to be done in six months and we're going to move on. Um, great question. I, I think service mesh definitely has value, which customers have traditionally realized via mishmash of NFVs, meaning, okay, you'll get a Palo Alto firewall, or you'll be, get uh, uh, some packet capture tool, or some intrusion uh, prevention device uh, as an NFV deployed uh, in, uh, in your virtual network. What service mesh does is, is sort of unifies that and provides that those capabilities in a seamless and consistent way. So, so you can view it as as the next uh, generation of of how NFVs are done and deployed in in the public cloud. Um, again, I I see that 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 different NFV players will start participating in the service mesh ecosystem and will start providing value additions on top of the 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 primitive service mesh capabilities that may be available. So, so I don't think uh, service mesh is a fad. I think it's, a, it's the next step in the evolution of NFVs uh, deployed uh, in the cloud as software appliances. So, so this is just, just uh, uh, creating a unified architecture for how to, to do that and how to manage that. Uh, kind of following up on, on what you said about um, NFVs being the fad, uh, with respect to 5G architectures, you're seeing NFVs already being uh, deployed for what's, what's um, called network slicing, an effort uh, in, in the telco space to uh, divide what's becoming the telco cloud into spaces that can then be virtually resold to service providers who may then provide that uh, telecom space for their customers. And I'm wondering when you're equating um, or comparing NFV to service mesh, whether service mesh is a better or more applicable, applicable way of, of attributing services to customers, a more applicable way than slicing up the network and perhaps creating redundant partitions and over-provisioning network infrastructure when perhaps some of that could be shared between customers? Yeah, I, I'm not the one here to actually oversell service mesh, right? Uh, to be very frank, uh, I've heard comments uh, uh, all the way from, hey, service mesh will replace everything. You do everything with service mesh. Uh, I'm not the one taking that position here or even stating that position here. I think service mesh provides uh, value in specific scenarios, uh, and the scenarios are around debugging, monitoring, uh, security, better security management, uh, and those scenarios, uh, there is demonstrated value for customers that customers need from the cloud. So I think service mesh will get used uh, in those scenarios. I'm not sure if service mesh will provide a better way of slicing uh, for customers, maybe, maybe not. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So, uh, uh, I think that's that's. Uh, I would say that that customers and we as an industry need to be really careful on on how much we sell service mesh. Uh, I think it's very important for us to be very focused on scenarios where service mesh uh, provides benefit to the customers and making sure that we make service mesh really great for those scenarios and not go after solving every networking problem that has existed uh, for decades. That's right.
Perfect. Thank you, Deepak. Thanks for the call.